Okay, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, or good morning. I mean, this could be completely global, who knows? Um, welcome to a comedian chats to people much cleverer than him. Now, I'm the comedian, some of you, um, of my subscribers, uh, of which there are 40, oh, hold on, uh, will know me uh, as a comedian. I just heard myself back there on YouTube, just making sure it all goes live. Uh, I'm the comedian, and uh, before I was a comedian, I, I did all sorts of weird and wonderful things, uh, which... It have given me a false sense of my own intellect, but actually I've not been intelligent for a long time. And I thought, do you know what? From that time in my life, there are people I know uh, who are much cleverer than me, who will help me make sense of the world that I kind of feel like I'm a bit of a, an observer of nowadays. Now, if you're on YouTube, uh, you can ask questions live, so make sure you do. And I'm going to introduce you to our guest today. He is um, an associate professor of practice at the University of Singapore, and he is the best-selling author of The Billionaire Raj, which in 2018 uh, was shortlisted for the Book of the Year by the FT and McKinsey. His name is James Crabtree, and he joins me all the way from Singapore. Hello, James. Good evening, Ishan. It's nine o'clock in the evening here, so a little bit later than you are. We've had our dinner, the children are packed in bed, and um, there we are, ready to talk about the lighter side of pandemics. Good, and I'm so glad that you've actually agreed to do this. Um, I'm glad we were able to negotiate a hefty fee for you as well. Very good. Yeah, I'd like to say I'm the first in your series, so this could also be the last of it. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Um, no, so, I recognise you, you, you're you a bit light on other work at the moment, so I'm glad. <laughs> I've always appreciated your support. That's always been a good thing for me. <laughs> so you're in Singapore. Um, how... Tell me, how is it you're, with, you're there with your family and your children, your wife and kids? Yeah, so, I mean, we're on lockdown here pretty much the same as the UK. Singapore started out this crisis early, so <laughs> um, first, um, first so affected by it back in January um, when Singapore started getting cases. And it did brilliantly for about two and a half months. Um, and then last week or the week before last, I can't remember, every day is the same now. Yeah. Um, slightly less brilliantly and started to get a lot more cases for reasons that we can talk about if you want to. Um, and so now we're on a nationwide lockdown, um, much the same as the UK. So you can go out for exercise and you can go to the shops, but there's no bars or restaurants open and all the schools are closed. And so everyone's hungered down indoors watching Tiger King on Netflix, just like everyone else. So have you finished Tiger King? No, we're on episode four. Uh, we, we're very bad at the watchers because my wife and I are always exhausted at the end of the day and started to get a lot more cases for reasons so that we one ever saw. Um, and so now we're on a nationwide lockdown, but um, much the same as the UK, so you can go out Okay, so I can't ask you for... Uh, shops, but I can't ask you a question which could give away any spoilers. Just can't just so everyone's hungered down. No, of course. No, I need to ask me up to the episode. So have you finished time? He's down his own... Um, crocodile barn. Um, that's that's about as far as we we've got to. Um, okay. Do you actually think he did that? Do you think he set fire to his own? I'm pretty sure he did. It certainly was <laughs> a pretty heavy um, heavy information. Uh, uh, yeah. So a little a little bit of Joe Exotic um, has been keeping us sane um, in the otherwise relentless daily routine of little bits of the homeschooling and trying to get some work done. So. Well, that was my next question. Have you have you negotiated homeschooling and keeping your children entertained when you're with them 24-7? Uh, by ruthless timetables. So we have um, a, 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 on the fridge in half hour or sometimes quarter hour increments, there's what the kids are meant to be doing every moment of the day. Um, I mean, I'm also teaching. I just finished my semester at the Lee Kuan Yew School, which is where I work, the public policy school here in Singapore. Uh, and so we've been doing online teaching there. But so we've got it the other way around with um, our son, who's at one of the international schools here. And so we get an email from them every morning saying what he should be doing. And then we have to struggle through this. The problem with this is that we unwisely decided to put him into Mandarin immersion. So we've now found ourselves on lockdown teaching our son a language that we don't understand. <laughs> what the time felt like, you know, a great sort of challenge that would put him in good stead. We're now deeply regretting because it's very difficult to teach your child Mandarin if you yourself don't understand a word of it. So, so are you having to do a course in Mandarin simultaneously just so you can keep pace? Well, uh, kids? That, would be, that would be a fine way of putting it. I mean, I'm struggling to very rudiments. He's much, much better than, than we will ever be, even at the age of five. Um, 
but so I, 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 the other day I had a minor triumph, which was I was able to write in Mandarin, I like cats, which is four, four, different, four different characters, Wu Zihuan, uh, Xiong Mao, uh, which I, I've got the tones all wrong there. But anyway, that was a triumph, but unfortunately it doesn't really help me help him, so there we are. But these are relatively small inconveniences. I mean, basically, we're fine. We're in one of the richest countries in the world. It has a great health service. It has a government that works. It's in a much better state. Even now, when it slightly dropped the ball in the last few weeks, it's in a much better state than the UK. And we're pretty lucky to be here, to be honest. Well, let, let's talk about that, because you, you alluded to it earlier. There's been a spike in cases, so it's gone to just under 6,000 when initially it was about 266. And people are saying that it's because of, um, in large part, because of the concentration of migrant workers living in, in cramped conditions. What's been your perspective on why there's been a spike? Yeah, that's exactly why it is. So, I mean, Singapore is a, Singapore is a very peculiar place, right? So many of your visitors might not be familiar with it. So it's an island city-state. It has a population of 6 million, but the native population, meaning actual Singaporeans, is only about 4.5 million. So there's a million and a half migrants, some of whom are like me, you know, working in universities or companies. But about 250,000 are construction workers, almost all of whom are from South Asia, from um, from Bangladesh, where you're from, or where you're from ancestrally, and yeah. from India, South India. And when they come over, the conditions that they live in are not as bad as uh, in the Gulf, in Qatar, but they're not yeah. great. You know, they live in, in dormitories, you know, a dozen men to a room. Uh, and unfortunately, um, this is, you know, when the virus got into these dormitories, it went hay haywire. And so this has been, although the Singaporean government has been as good as anywhere in most aspects of their response, they still have had a bit of a blind spot for this. And, and so now they have a, this public health crisis in these dormitories that they're trying to deal with that has led to a huge spike in cases. So. At least the dorms in Singapore, I guess they have walls. I know in Qatar and the Gulf, they kind of sleep on open construction sites and fall kind of 40, 50 floors um, while they're asleep. So at least Singapore is giving them that much. Yeah, I'm not, a, I have to say, I'm not an expert on this. My, my sense is that if you were um, ranking kind of worst places in the world to be a construction worker, then Singapore is much better than the Gulf, um, but still not, not great. I mean, th these are not great conditions. And so now you have thousands, possibly tens of thousands of these um, these workers who are basically kind of locked down in, in these dorms or being shifted to other places to, you know, moved into the sports stadiums or car parks or unfinished public housing blocks just to try and kind of get them out of these situations. So so it's been, a, it's, yeah, the, we in Singapore were feeling pretty smug about our um, our pandemic for yeah. about two because Singapore just appeared to have knocked it out of the park. It was very effective in what it had done. And to be fair, the government here is very good. You know, they, they know they know what they're doing. This is as good as anywhere in the world. But they um yeah, they sort of slightly dropped the ball, I think, over the last few weeks and they are now trying to work out how to pick it back up again. Talk us through briefly what the initial response was. Why was it so successful? What did they do? Um, so one of the big things I think that has, if you, there's a big Sunday Times report in the UK this morning that a lot of people are talking about on social yeah. media, report about why the UK response was so bad. And in there, there was a little paragraph which amidst all the stuff about why Boris uh, didn't turn up at various Cobra meetings, there was a paragraph which basically said, in Asia, people had experience of SARS and H1N1 and Zika and all of these other things that could have become pandemics. And basically, when they, they knew a potential pandemic when they saw one, and then you tell you, so yeah. you think cholera, or since the Spanish flu that anyone had had experienced of was flu. And so Singapore had, along with Taiwan, South Korea, China, you know, they had some experience of dealing with potential pandemics of this sort. And then in Singapore, I don't know, there are a whole range of different factors. They've got a very good healthcare system. They're very good at this... Um, new thing people are talking about, contact tracing, where if you get sick, um, they very quickly find out all of the people who you've been in touch with um, and then put all them into quarantine in case they get it. Um, and, and so that they, they had a very efficient system of doing that. But basically, it's just it's a high quality government that knows what, it, what it's doing. And it was able to keep a grip on the, the spread of the outbreak in a way that in the UK and in the US, they just weren't able to it kind of by the time that they found out that the pandemic, the, one, the, the virus had spread, then there was nothing really to be done. It was kind of, it was too broadly spread to be managed anymore. So Singapore was just pretty efficient. I think as you mentioned this in terms of the Sunday Times report, in it, they talked about um, 
Martin Hibbard, who is a professor of emerging infectious diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he said that the pandemic plans that, the, that Singapore had in 2003, 2009 were British plans, but Singaporeans, the simple government, actually implemented it. So yeah, it's another case of Britain kind of being like, do as I say, not as I do, because I don't think anyone wants to emulate what Britain does. But Singapore were able to take that plan and put it into practice. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, so I used to work for the British government back in the day. So in um, while, when we knew each other uh, at the kind of fag end of the Blair Brown years, I worked in, in the government for a thing called the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. And there was lots of interplay between the British and American, British and Singaporean governments. And we were always quite shocked to discover that a lot of the ideas that, that we had said would be good ideas for the government to do and never quite got round to doing. If you went to Singapore, you'd find that they'd actually done it. So the Singaporeans are pretty good at implementing ideas. But I think the thing to take out of Singapore and its experience is a sort of slightly more pessimistic point, which is about the nature of how this crisis is going to unfold. So in the West, um, in countries like the UK, France, Germany, you know, beginning to just cope with the end of the first wave, but Singapore is now on its third wave of infections. And, and this, in a sense, is the problem that we're all moving into, which is even if you extend great efforts to you know, sort of whack the mole on the first time around, yeah. it's going to be in somewhere else. Um, and there's no guarantee that if you did very well on the first round that you're going to do well on all subsequent rounds. You know, it, it's kind of, it only takes one set of mistakes to, um, to have a, a kind of outbreak that you then have to slam the brakes on again. So I think that's the, the kind of lesson from Singapore. The thing that I've kind of observed is... There's kind of three three parts to how a government decides to respond to, it, to respond to this. It's attitude, the equipment it's had, it, it's got, and it's general attitude to testing. The question is here also on YouTube. Someone's asking, is Singapore's response reflected of a well-funded health, healthcare system? So I guess it's a two-part question, which is, do attitudes differ? And you mentioned the fact that Singapore has previously had experience of what could be a pandemic and pandemics, but also the fact that they've had a, had a well-funded healthcare system are those the things that set it apart from, say, a UK or American response? I don't know if it's quite as simple as to talk about the funding of the healthcare, healthcare system. So if you think about the American example, Americans have a fantastically expensive healthcare system with some of the best hospitals in the world, mm. uh, and they completely screwed up their response in all sorts of different ways, which, which are... Donald Trump! Well, not quite, so, yeah, I mean, Trump partly, but also the kind of chaotic, decentralized nature of the way the American system seems to work and some of the underlying inequalities that exist in that system. So the coverage of the healthcare system is superb if you're rich, but patchy if you're poor. So Singapore has a pretty good healthcare system. It's great, great value for money. Um, you know, it has some problems. It's not, it's not perfect, but it's often seen as a kind of, as a, as a model of how to deliver high quality healthcare at reasonable costs. But I don't think it's so much the healthcare system that really matters. It's the bit of the healthcare system which is designed to deal with pandemics or designed to deal with infectious diseases. Um, right. And so that bit of the Singaporean system was very good. You know, they had this brand new center, National Center for Infectious Diseases, which was only opened a couple of years ago, which they um, that, that they put through after the SARS outbreak. You know, they had all of these contact tracing teams ready to go. They sort of had a playbook. They knew what they were, they knew what they were dealing with. They weren't having to kind of work it out from scratch. And like a lot of these Asian countries, they also had stockpiles, you know, so they right. had the faces and masks and whatnot, you know. So, so Taiwan, in a sense, is the one we probably should be talking about because they're the one who really did do it kind of perfectly and have continued to do it perfectly. But they had the same thing, you know, really good healthcare system, but also uh, focused knowledge on, on how to deal with this stuff, good stockpiles, good political leadership, you know, knew what it was doing, not divided, not too partisan, um, you know, all of these things. So. The stockpiling thing is an important point because I said this when it first happened, that as an Asian person, I was kind of prepared for the pandemic because we'd been stockpiling food from since I was born, just because that's how we buy stuff. And my parents socially distanced me from my friends from when I was a kid anyway. So I was, I'm completely prepared for this. You've got you've got a full full cupboard of, of staple ready to <laughs> yeah. be um, yeah, we, we've now got, I mean, as I'm sure most most fortunate people in the world, we have, our cupboard is groaning under weight of sort of pasta and chickpeas and lentils. Actually, no chickpeas. You can't get chickpeas. It's one of the few things that have totally run out. But yeah, so we've all learned to do a little bit of hoarding. So I would never have imagined chickpeas to be massively popular in Singapore. I don't know uh, why. 
can't get chickpeas anywhere. Toilet roll is absolutely plentiful. Hand san is back in every shop, but can't get chickpeas for love nor money now. I don't know why that is. I've been trying to work out work it out, but anyway. Uh, is Singapore when, when you, a B-Day nation? Uh, Singapore or is not no no not B days. It's the the bit like South Asia. It's the uh, the the kind of extra um, extra hose, as it were. Yes, with, yeah. Uh, that you the, direct. I the, the most efficient solution. I don't really I hold with B days. I affectionately call it the bum gun. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're, we're bum gunned up over here. Okay, you're bum gunned up. Okay. Now, um, so you've lived in the US, UK, India, and Singapore, right? Those are the four countries? Right. Yeah. Right now in the pandemic, would you say that you are in the best possible country to be in? Uh, just about, yeah. I mean, I, you could argue the toss about here or Taiwan or Hong Kong, I suppose. But, I think but of the four countries that you've lived in? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, no, no, no doubt, no doubt. You'd rather be here than anywhere else. I mean, I think it's 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 it much better than any of the others. So. Let's talk about India because you spent uh, a lot of time in India. How long were you there? Five years. Do you speak Hindi? I do not. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I, I we we learned for about two or three months and then uh, kind of gave up because so we lived in Mumbai where people don't really speak Hindi anyway. But because mm-hmm. I was. I was a business correspondent, so I spent my life talking to bankers and financiers, and nobody ever spoke Hindi. And so learning Hindi was a sort of interesting intellectual exercise, but it was a bit like learning ancient Greek. It was something that you were doing for your own sort of self-satisfaction. It had no real utility in the job that I was doing, and so eventually we got lazy and we just gave up. So Okay, fair enough. Um, Let's talk about India's response then, because in India at the moment, it looks like they've only had about 500 deaths, which is pretty good for a country of that size. But the interesting development that I saw that you tweeted about was this lockdown on FDI from China. Um, and you said that it was a sign of things to come. What what do you mean by that? Oh, I mean, I, ju- I mean that in the aftermath of economic crises, which I think is what we're going to have on a big scale, uh, the governments tend to get much more protectionist. So they, you've seen this with uh, medical equipment. So anyone who has medical equipment um, is keeping it at home and, and not, or many, many money countries are stopping exporting or even of intermediate goods. So things like rubber from a country like Malaysia, that you need to make rubber gloves, which are for protective equipment. There have been restrictions put on various commodities that you need, but particularly if you have masks, um, you put a lockdown on that. So you start with masks, then you go to food, um, you know, people who are worried about food supplies stop exporting food, so world food prices go up, and then you start getting protectionism in other forms. And so, what India India is what India is worried about is because there's been big falls in stock markets. They're worried that the Chinese, in particular, will come along and buy Indian companies at knockdown prices. Now, whether or not that's remotely realistic, I'm not really sure because I've not really seen any Chinese investors go and buy Indian companies. I mean, it seems like a weird thing that they would want to do that, uh, given how difficult the Indian market is. But the fact that India is worried about this Mm. is a kind of sign of of where we're going to go. Some of that's pretty sensible. I mean, it's pretty clear after this that lots and lots of countries are going to try and make more stuff that they would have liked to have had about six weeks ago. And so a lot of that is medical equipment. But there will also be a range of other things that are now seen to be strategic that you should make at home that you know you shouldn't be making in China or you know South yeah. Korea, wherever it might be. I think it's just a sort of sign of the world we're moving into, which is one where drawbridges will be being um, drawn up a little bit. Well, this protectionist idea seems to have taken gathered a lot of pace over the last few years. We had Brexit, then of course Donald Trump, make America great again. Um, but as you wrote in the Nikkei Asian Review, this required a global response, but we were expecting global response at a time when countries, big major economies, are becoming more protectionist. And do you think that after all this is said and done, let, let alone individuals, but states are going to become less protectionist or more? Because we needed a global response and we didn't get one. Yeah, that's Two sort of slightly different issues. So the protectionism is going to creep up. And the real problem um, that we face at the moment is economic collapse. It's not protectionism. So the reason why, I don't know, trade is collapsing and all of our economies are going to go into the toilet 
uh, is not so much because of protectionism, is because nobody's spending any money. Um, you know, no one's going to restaurants, no one's buying cars, no one's buying washing machines. Um, you know, all of that has stopped in a way that we haven't seen before. You know, so not not in my lifetime. Um, I bought a toaster uh, the other the day. My toaster busted, so maybe I'm helping the economy. Good, you're a hero. <laughs> You're a hero coming to the lesson. It's small, <laughs> small acts of brave you know, poetry thing that you yes. keep this sort of shit out. Uh, you Thank know, you for Mary, recognizing Mary, my, my, my Yeah, you're a, you're a hero. You should get some kind of medal. <laughs> I really um, should. Mary, my wife, Mary, my wife just bought a soda stream today in the aid of, you know, some uh, whirlpool or something like that. Some country <laughs> by our uh, sort of $39 and change. Um, so the protectionism comes next. It, it's sort of after you've had the, the crunch, uh, then what, one of the reactions that, that, company, that countries take when they are struggling um, is to try and protect their own through protectionism. And so that's what happened in the Great Depression. So the, the Great Depression was kicked off in 1929, and you had a, a kind of, you know, an economic collapse after that. But the Great Depression went on for four years, and partly... The reason why it happened was in 1931, 1932, there was a series of measures between the United States and Europe and a few other econ economies where they started introducing all sorts of trade barriers. And so they took a problem that was caused by a stock market collapse and a kind of domestic economic collapse, and they made it much worse by having a lot of protectionism. So I guess the worry is that in addition to all the other stuff that we've got to worry about, you know, potential financial crisis and that sort of thing. You, many of the measures that countries will take to try and protect themselves will end up being counterproductive. So that, that that's the that's the problem. The thing I wrote about in the Nikkei piece is a bit different. That's about why the global bodies that are meant to be acting are not able to act, and that's much more wrapped up in rowing between the U.S. and China. In the Nikkei piece, yeah, you, why they aren't acting in the way they should have done, but. Do you not think that that's just reflective of the fact that global governance generally over the last 10, 20 years has been quite ineffective across various aspects of global society? No, I don't think so. I think it's a much newer phenomenon. So if you look, if you think about the a lot of people have talked about it, it's not an original point. Um, but in 2014, you had an Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Now, the World Health Organization was not terribly effective at dealing with that. But um, in the end, the United States and some other countries sort of swooped in and sent soldiers to into these countries that were affected um, and helped to coordinate a response. In 2008, after the financial crisis, I mean, the global authorities didn't exactly cover themselves in glory, but mm. there was a reasonably effective national coordinated response. And th that those mechanisms just aren't working this time around. You know, the UN, um, it was never really at the heart of this, but the G20, the group of big countries that's meant to fix these sort of problems working together to do things like persuade countries not to introduce lots of new protectionism or to set up pools of money to look for a vaccine or all sorts of things that you want people to be doing at the moment. And a lot of it isn't happening. Um, and a lot of it isn't happening because of, well, partly because of Trump, but in particular because Trump and the US and China are fighting with one another. And that makes everything else more difficult. You know, I mean, it's tough. I don't, I don't want to be too much of a jerk about this because the, you know, it's a hell of a difficult time, and so political leaders are really struggling to find a way to uh, deal with the problems that they have in their home countries. I mean, this is the biggest crisis that we have faced in a couple of generations, um, and so it shouldn't be entirely surprising that there isn't much bandwidth left for, you know, the hard graft of international diplomacy. But anyway, th th there's no way out of this crisis without international agreements you know yeah. you, you can't can't win this in one country you've got to kind of come up with a global solution that encompasses not just britain and america but countries like india or bangladesh as well do you think the economic crisis here is going to be deeper and worse than 2008 yeah i think so yeah i mean it, it, I, I, I mean i'm it's hard to tell. It might be that a vaccine is mysteriously produced in three weeks' time, and we look back on this at Christmas and think, well, that was pretty awful, but it wasn't as bad as we all thought it was going to be at the time. Um, but there's just never been uh, an economic collapse of this type. I mean, in 2008, it was the American housing market that collapsed, and then that pushed some banking um, sectors in the UK and the US, Iceland, a few other places that then dominoed into the Eurozone crisis. But 
it wasn't fully global and the scale of the downturn, nothing like what we've seen even now. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it, I think unfortunately it is going to be worse. Um, just thankfully the scale, even if the international response has been um, pretty hopeless, the, the scale of the national response by individual governments has actually been quite impressive. Mm. Um, so, you know, $5 trillion, which is what they've they've said. So I was interviewing a, um, a, an economist here who said, you know, look, you, you can't be too critical. That's not nothing. That, that's not that's not throwing the kitchen sink at the problem. That's throwing the whole kitchen. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, this is a vast, has been flooded into global markets. So, um, you know, th- 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 that has for now, or some time, um, because otherwise there really would have been a financial crisis in the last few weeks if um, if the the you know the big central banks and the big governments hadn't got their checkbooks out. Um, right, just a quick reminder to those of you on YouTube: please do ask questions. It's a rare opportunity to speak to someone of James's tremendous intellect and experience and ask whatever you need to ask. Um, so make sure you do. Uh, let's talk to on a, on a cheering point. Did you see the news about um, Tom Moore, the war veteran who raised twenty million pounds for the NHS in the UK? I, I did, although only cursorily. So what what was the what was the story? Is, he, is this the guy who was running into a marathon? Yeah, so he's a war veteran who served in India and Burma who was doing laps of his garden with his with his Zimmer frame and he wanted to do 100 laps by his 100th birthday and he wanted to raise a £1,000 but he ended up raising £20 million for the NHS which is really quite lovely um, for, for a 19-year-old man. Do countries like Singapore and in- India ever have those kind of stories? Does that happen? Where people are just... Wanting to raise money for the health service or something? Yes and no. I mean, the, the 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 it has often been said that in the UK that the NHS is the kind of closest the country has to an official state religion. Um, yeah. And although Singaporeans are very proud of their healthcare system, it's a much more kind of decentralised system than the NHS. It doesn't have a single brand. It's not entirely state-run. You know, you have a mixture of government hospitals and private companies that run hospitals. And so there isn't quite the same attachment to uh, a single institution. And so while you've had here, you know, many of the same acts of kind of civic generosity and pride in the nature of the response, and I think people here are very proud of the way that their government has operated, it hasn't quite focused on the the health service in in the same way that it has in the UK. I mean, India is a whole different beast. I was actually chatting to various friends who were on lockdown in Mumbai and Delhi last night, and the Indian system is obviously much, much patchier. Um, So there hasn't been, but also the need in the Indian system is much greater. And so you've seen you know, a lot of acts of, of sort of civic generosity just to get food to people who were you know, these rather biblical scenes of hundreds of thousands of people who are having to walk back to their villages in the early stages of the lockdown three weeks ago, many of whom had nothing to eat. And so, um, you know, that there was lots of charitable um, acts to try and help these people. Um, but, yeah, not quite in the same way as the UK, I don't think. One thing I, I, I thought was very heartening, but I also felt like that could have put a lot of pressure, maybe because I, I was raised in an Asian family, I feel like seeing an old dude do that well would have put a lot of pressure on other older people. So Rishi Sunak could have been like, look at him. Why can't you be more like Tom? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see the, 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 the right exemplar uh, that uh, you know the parents would look up to. But if he's 90 years old, then I mean, he must be pushing it. 99. He was 99. So in time for his 100th birthday. I'm good. Very good of him. <laughs> um, now, big, go on. we've done we've done absolutely nothing uh, of, of any kind of moral worth during this crisis, apart from uh, you know, apart from sort of trying to stock our stock our cupboards and stop our kids going the house. I can't claim any any um, any kind of moral uh, high ground. So, if you were going to do something to raise money, what would you do, given? Gosh, uh, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, I haven't got the foggiest idea. We don't have a garden, so we can't do laps in the garden. We do have a swimming pool in our condo, but the swimming pool is now closed, so I can't do okay. laps. In the so okay. yeah, we're, we're a bit, a bit 
limited. So there's almost when you're almost all of the things that you would normally think about doing, you know, your kind of pointless acts, a tweed charity, have a bake sale or a bring and buy. You can't do any of these things under social distancing. So yeah, probably have to do something. Probably have to do something outrageous on a Zoom call and get sponsored for it. <laughs> I look forward to seeing your just giving page. <laughs> on that one. Um, now, uh, I'm a comedian. At the end of the day, I'm a comedian and I want to talk about funny things. So let's talk about another funny thing, which is the UK's response to this whole thing, um, um, which has been nothing, um, short, nothing short of shambolic. So the Sunday Times thing that you referred to article today was so eye-opening. But the thing is, I don't think it was particularly surprising. The fact that we went to... Um, the uh, In Vitro Diagnostics Association, which is the main, uh, which represents most of the UK's testing sector, uh, sector, the government went to them on the 1st of April to say, we need your support. What have you made of the UK's response and Boris Johnson throughout this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, so I think they're two separate questions, right? So Boris, in a funny way, by, I mean, and so I think we would all wish him a speedy recovery, which thankfully it looks like he's getting, but by by virtue of his personal story, it has for a while distracted from what looks like one of the least competent responses in Europe. Um, and it's only now over the last few days that you've begun to see some sort of cracks in the in a sense the public mood where the public mood has been quite as far as i can see quite supportive of the government um and it's just in a sense i, I think the uk started too late there was a very good twitter storm um, by an irish journalist uh, at the beginning of last week basically pointing out that you know the uk and ireland started in basically the same place they got their first infections on the same day they have almost identical not identical but they have very similar um, so starting points, they have the same number of critical care beds and that kind of thing. And Ireland locked down two weeks earlier and yeah. it's outbreak and it was bad. And, and so I think, you know, the, in addition, I have some sympathy with the, the government insofar as when journalists, and I was a journalist for a long time, so when journalists sort of get access to a bit of the, the kind of guts of what was going on inside the government, then it looks chaotic, but then all government is chaotic. You know, if you knew what's going on behind there, spinning plates and trying to keep the lights on. Um, at a fundamental level, the problem with the, the British response was they just started too late. Um, and and it, had they locked down two weeks earlier, then things would have been much improved. And then there are some problems that, you know, the UK doesn't have, a, you know, an industrial base, which is very good at making ventilators and, and, and that sort of thing. But I think um, if you compare, just to give it a kind of slightly more positive spin, if you think back to Brexit, remember Brexit? We were all yeah. wondering about yeah, we're not talking about that anymore. Yeah. But Brexit this kind of sense that the British government, in an American sense, in a sort of almost Trumpian sense, was kind of fundamentally broken. Uh, the country was divided right down the middle. You couldn't get anything done. You had you know week after week of parliamentary intrigue, um, and at least that feeling has slightly gone. You know, that it does appear that the British political elite is at least sort of united and purposeful. It's trying its best to. To, to do things, not working perfectly, um, not as well as Germany, probably, you know, as well as other major European Nothing ever are. works as well as Germany does stuff, really. Right. Yeah, it's, not, it's not sort of immediately clear to me that the British response has been massively worse than France, Italy, or Spain. Um, it just it just hasn't hasn't been better. Um, and it started, it started too late, so... Um, but I, I think you're right. We did start too late, but there's also just been a lot of well, I don't want to call it lying, but kind of misleading. So, for example, Matt Hancock talking about the PP that's available. My dad is a paramedic, uh, as you know, and he tells me when he comes back from shifts that they, they don't have masks. He told me that there was going to be a lack of gowns, and the very next day they announced that actually there is a lack of gowns. And I don't know why political leaders do this, why they can't... I understand that you want to show positive leadership, but I don't understand why they can't just say, look, honestly, we haven't got enough and we're trying really hard to make it work. 
Yeah, I mean, it, I, I I agree with you. I, I think there have been some communication missteps. Um, one of the problems in the British response has been that it hasn't really been clear who's in charge. So, particularly because the prime minister has been sick, uh, but you know, you've had different ministers on different days. Um, you know, some have been quite effective. Matt Hancock for a few days appeared to be quite effective. Dominic Raab less effective. And so, one of the things that the, the good governments here in Asia have done has been very um, effective in the way that they've communicated around the crisis. And so when you're in the middle of a crisis, I think they probably say these things just because they have to get through that day's news briefing. Um, and that often leads you to say things that you think are justifiable at the time, but then you get some more information, which actually tells you, actually, we haven't got any masks or we haven't got any gowns or whatever it might be. And then people accuse you of hypocrisy when you're probably not trying to be hypocritical. You're just trying to put the best gloss on things given what you know. So again, I, I have some sympathy with the enormous pressure which the, the ministers um, are under. And as I say, you know, compared to compared to the US, the British response doesn't seem uh, it seems reasonably well coordinated. Um, so here's something that I'm very interested in your perspective on, beyond everything I've asked you already, is the fact that we now have a, a Tory government that are having to take these public funding steps and having to take in in effect what you would class as kind of socialist steps to keep us afloat can you see there being a a shift in thinking when this all passes over on how not just the tories but across europe and across the world we think about how economies and societies are structured yeah i mean i think it's been one of the more positive sides of the crisis um that things that appear to be completely impossible suddenly become possible. Um, you know, you have uh, effectively kind of forms of universal basic income, which appear to be completely out of bounds, basically being over introduced overnight. You have central bank financing in ways that we've never seen before. All sorts of things that were said to be way beyond the pale suddenly were introduced, uh, both on the fiscal and the monetary side, and that's great. I mean, in a sense, that shows that given given enough of a crisis and, and a kind of trap wall that you're standing yeah. over, people will, will think differently. Way, way further down the line, when, in a sense, this is under control and there's some framework for uh, kind of getting back to something approaching normality, there is an interesting question for this Conservative government, which is, do they... Is the kind of is this a fundamental shift in their thinking, or do you then revert back to a kind of Cameron Osborne era austerity politics in order to bring what will be a wacky increase in public debt back under control? Mm. And that's a good case for not doing that because global interest rates appear like appear as if they're going to be very low for a very long time. Mm. Uh, at least that's what people think now. But you know, it's been very ingrained in the Conservative Party's thinking over the last decade that, you know, Labour are a bunch of spendthrift shysters and the Conservative yeah. Party from sound money. So, but we were such a long way away from there at the moment that I, I think it's almost premature to begin to be thinking about this as to what the instincts of, of the politicians are going to be when, you know, in two years' time, when you look at the, the kind of the wreckage of the public finances and think, okay, well, how do we clamber out of this hole that we have got ourselves into um, because of the extraordinary measures that we've taken over the last couple of years? Uh, before I ask you about America, I've just got two questions come through on YouTube. One is um, from Nigel Lang. Hey, James, do you think the aftermath of this is that globalization morphs back to localization? And from Alan, Alan Oakes has asked, um, would implementing hard as nails tax measures on companies like Google and Amazon be a workable option to fund healthcare services globally? Uh, the second one, not really. I mean, uh, health services are incredibly expensive. And so even if you were to tax Google absolutely to the hill, you're not going to get enough money out of them to, to come anywhere close to what you need to fund health services, particularly because, I mean, so we, health services will get more money after this. Pandemic preparedness will get more money. Um, but in general, as we have aging populations, the amount of money that has to go into health services is going up, up, up. You, know, you need money to put it in healthcare technology and all sorts of things. Um, and so just thinking, okay, we can we can tax these companies, most of whom in any case are American, uh, yeah. isn't 
a sustainable answer to that. Yeah, the globalization question is something I've been thinking about a lot. So that, that's one of my main interests here in Singapore. I don't think it's not clear to me what localization means. Um, but yes, one of the things that will happen out of this is, in a sense, the kind of the, the go go years of globalization, you know, in 2005, say, whatever the high point was before the financial crisis. Mm. Uh, we'll going back to that, you know, the world that we're moving into will be you know, a little bit less interconnected, will have less uh, less trade flowing around between borders. The, the, the companies that, you know, the company that, uh, when, when Apple makes your iPhone, the bits that go in your iPhone will have traveled around the world a little bit less than they used to. Um, and, and then there's certainly scenarios if the US and China keep scrapping with one another in which you have a, a kind of more severe um, return to, you know, it's a sense of regionalism, I think, you know, sort of trade within Europe, trade within Asia, trade within North America, but not truly global uh, trade. So, yeah, a kind of rollback of the globalization that we've been used to um, with various complicated consequences. So it's a good question. Good question. Okay, we're going to play a game of verses in just a minute where I'm going to give you two options and you get to tell me which one you prefer and why. But before we do, just a cursory look at America. Have you ever been in a presentation or delivered a lecture which is going badly and then you play a video to remind everyone of your achievements and the good things that you've done? Have you ever done done that before? I've never done that. I do when I give lectures. I do actually have quite a lot of videos in my lectures because if um, if the lecturer is going badly or the, or the student is bored, then sort of two-minute video clip perks everybody up because they get to watch TV for a while. And so I do I do, do that, but not, uh, not, not about myself. <laughs> well, you know, so Trump did that at the press conference. Um, it was absolutely remarkable with, the, with the, the attacks that he has always has on CNN. But do you think, Boris to a lesser extent, but certainly Trump, the whole handling of this is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back? Or do you think the electorate are just going to be too focused on the fact that we need to survive this pandemic and not worry about his electoral chances at some point in the future? Uh, it's funny, it's such a difficult question to answer, and I just, I don't know. I mean, every fibre of my being says that that he he should lose now. Um, or you know, that, that, that's my own kind of personal... Um, he just hope. seems unbeatable, though, the guy. Well, I mean, if you look, so most of the research suggests that what matters in American elections isn't really what we think. So we look a lot at the personalities and what they look like and what their policies are. Really what matters is how the economy is doing. I mean, that, that's sort of what the research says. And so if the economy is doing terribly, then presidents tend to lose. And if it's doing fine, then they should get reelected. And so that was the basic case for Trump. So Trump, uh, he, he was presiding over a fantastic, fast-growing economy. He didn't have a primary challenge, which is another thing that tends to um, damage incumbents. And so prior to all of this happening, I mean, I was pretty pessimistic about um, his chances of um, not getting reelected. Now he's going to be presiding over an economic calamity with, um, you know, 30 million people unemployed, you know, something that you haven't seen and potentially more, you know, sort of levels of unemployment that have never been seen. Mm. Uh, and so the he should lose under those circumstances. He deserves to lose. I mean, he, he's incredibly incompetent and, and this has really found out, uh, you know, in, in a sense that the worry with Trump was that, you know, eventually he would be trusted by some crisis, but I don't think, I mean, I think people were imagining under those circumstances a kind of Cuban missile style crisis where yeah. something happened to China and he had to keep a cool head. I don't think anybody really envisaged a crisis of this magnitude. Um, on the other hand, however, you know, as you say, he he's a very astute campaigner, and he, I think, is going to run a rather nasty anti-Chinese nationalist campaign. And there is a constituency in America which wants to hear that. You know, there's still 35, 40 percent of the American public that thinks Trump is terrific and and really sees no, um, you know, sees no fault in him. And and so I and Joe Biden as a candidate has, you know, he's old. He's not the kind of sharpest campaigner he, he's you know he's not he's not the ideal or perfect candidate by any means so i'm still pretty nervous about what might happen in the u.s election i think it's very very hard to read how it's going to pan out it'll be interesting to see um number of the zakarias uh, sent mess uh, question james are indian billionaires still talking to you after your book and is there another superb book coming soon yeah, um, some of them, some of them are. So I, I got myself sued by one of these uh, these billionaires for a hundred million dollars, 
um, although not for what was in the book. So, so some of them, some of them don't. <laughs> actually, actually, I still managed to keep on reasonably cordial terms. So, uh, for those of you who have absolutely no idea about this, I, I wrote a book called The Billionaire Raj, which was about the, the rise of India's new super rich. Um, that featured pen portraits of various um, kind of racy and unsavory Indian billionaires. And um, yeah, so most of those that I wrote about, I, I have kind of kept in touch with a little bit and, um, and, and they didn't entirely throw me out of the will. So, uh, so yeah, not, not, not too bad. I'm, I'm pondering, pondering another book, but I don't have a, don't have a, a kind of final idea yet. So lockdown, hopefully coronavirus lockdown will be good for pondering new book ideas. So Maybe, maybe Russian billionaires? Why not? Yeah, well, I think you have to live in Russia to do that. So it's a bit difficult to do from afar. So, <laughs> yeah, that may uh, be true. <laughs> billionaires, so. um, not quite billionaire. I hosted a wedding for a very wealthy Indian uh, hotelier. And it was everything you can possibly imagine the a wedding of a very wealthy hotelier's daughter was going to be. They had a, a marquee that's housed two and a half thousand people that changed themes seven times over the course of three days. It was absolutely insane. I hope you were well paid for this. I was paid very handsomely. Thank you. <laughs> this, uh, this, uh, these sour days and now these straight some times for comedians. I almost got shot by Sadiq Khan's security that day. Very good. Okay. That's um, impressive. I was I was walking off uh, after I'd finished, and Sadiq Khan got up and kind of stumbled over his chair. And I went to instinctively went to grab him, and I looked across the, my peripherals, and two of his security guards had their hands on their holsters, ready to shoot. And Sadiq had to kind of calm him down. So that was my claim to fame. I would have been more impressed if you'd said you'd nearly got shot by Salman Khan's uh, security. <laughs> well. I had to make do with Sadiq. Right. Uh, I'm very conscious of your time and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. And I think hopefully a lot of people are going to appreciate your insight and perspective. Uh, I want to play a game of verses with you now. So what I'm going to do, because you've had such a, a wonderful, you've lived in you've, those four countries and have so many wonderful experiences. I'm going to give you some options. And all I want you to do is tell me which one you prefer and why. Is that fair? Right. Okay. Uh, noodles or rice? Rice. Why? Oh, God knows why. I like I like rice and salads. So there we are. Uh, okay. Let's green some. Okay. Now, I'm conscious that you're you're now a vegan, uh, but burger or pie? Uh, burger because you can have them vegetarian. So uh, okay. yeah, but they, they have no no vegan pies over here, despite the miracle of Greg's in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> football or basketball? Football, um, although really cricket, but but football. Yeah. Although I'm foot six, I was hopeless at basketball. So. Uh, LSE or Harvard? Uh, I guess I'll go for Harvard because I went there most recently, but uh, uh, I love the LSE too. Singapore or India? India, yeah. Oh. India, definitely. Wow, interesting. Fine. US or UK? Uh, UK, despite my wife who's American, so I'll go with the home team. <laughs> and uh, Donald Trump or Narendra Modi? Oh, goodness. Uh, I mean, I suppose I'd go for Modi because he's at least in some senses a competent technocrat, but uh, that's a really hard decision to go for. So, Modi by a whisker. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Modi by a whisker. Right, okay, well, look, uh, James, thank you so much for your time. I've really, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. I hope you have also enjoyed giving me some of your time. It's lovely to catch up. I, uh, I'll look forward to seeing the rise and rise of your career when you're able to go back and do gigs again um meantime i'll just catch up on old ishan clips on youtube so it's uh, it's a great pleasure thanks for having me on i look forward to future editions of this series yeah and uh, that's a good plug for me make sure you subscribe so i'm going to uh, interview even more people uh, over the coming weeks uh, and months but uh, maybe i'll come to singapore and do some gigs there that might be fun they do, they do have a few stand-up comics here so uh, yeah i uh a few, a few pop through. So, uh, yeah, you'd be welcome. Good. Well, look, uh, guys, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to make this available on YouTube uh, going forward and also as a podcast very, very soon. So catch up on that. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. Once again, James Crabtree, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, you, John. All the best. Right. Let's see how we can stop.